I didn't like this book. Where did all these heavily accented Irish people come from? Running New York City. Like what? <laughs> Contender for one of my favorite books of the year. Testing. Hi. It's been a while. Welcome to the video. My name is Carrie. Thank you for being here. I haven't spoken to you in so long. Many announcements. I am home, clearly. Um, got off the airplane almost exactly 24 hours ago. I'm back from Slovenia. That vlog will be up soon on my other channel, Carrie Cakes. Oh my god, like the most beautiful place. I am so excited to share that with you. Um, I did some damage. I did some book shopping. More to come from that. But I'm here to talk to you about what I read. What month is this? September. What I read in September. I'm also gonna cheat a little bit because it is the first week of October and I want to talk about the books that I've already read in October because I will forget them. It never hurts to talk about books twice. I change my mind about books like, oops. The longer I sit with books, the more that my thoughts kind of change on them. So it will be exciting to give you how I feel about them right after I read them and then do another talk about them in my wrap up next month, okay? That's my plan. Also, the lighting in this video, it's gonna be weird because I'm filming quite early. Um, I'm gonna edit this and get this to you as soon as possible, which is why I'm filming it right after I got off an airplane. So the, the light is just, the sun is in a different place than it usually is when I'm filming. Um, so it's gonna, well, it is what it is. Okay, I also didn't, is this plugged in? Oh, here you go. At least that will look normal. Um, so excited to talk to you. Before we begin, I'm even more excited than usual, I think, to talk about the sponsor of this video, which is Book of the Month. Thank you so much to Book of the Month. <gasps> okay, so as you know, Book of the Month is a monthly subscription service where their team of readers go through all of the new releases for this month. They will pick their favorites and offer them to you at a low controlled price. So they're always going to be new releases, hard covers. Sometimes they're debut authors. Sometimes they're authors that you know and love. They're from across all different genres. Famously, book of the month is the reason why I started reading romance because I got the love hypothesis on a whim and look at me now. Okay. Always love their picks. This month, was actually torture because I could not narrow it down. The good thing about Book of the Month is you can choose one or more books. They also have now add-ons, so you can get more, okay? You can. Um, you can also, for your first book, use the code PUMPKIN to get your first book for $5. A hardcover, newly released book. $5. Okay, so let me tell you what I finally ended up picking for. Oh, oh my god. Here's the here's the box that you get them in. Okay, oh my god. Um, there's something really precious in here. So the first book that I chose, I'm so excited about, is The Wild Huntress. This is by Emily Lloyd Jones, who wrote The Bone Houses, which I really liked. She wrote Drowned Trees the drowned woods, uh, which I also kind of like. I love the ambiance that she creates. Um, and this one is about every five years, two kingdoms take part in the wild hunt. Joining is a bloody risk and even the best hunters can suffer the most gruesome fates. Oh my gosh, we have people with Welsh sounding names that I can't pronounce. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm very, very excited for this. So that was my first one. My add-on, my special choice. Guys, I'm about to be so annoying. Intermezzo by Sally Rooney. The book you've seen everywhere since before it came out. You can get it on book of the month as an add-on this month. Um, I have it. So this is really going to be the tiebreaker for me. I have read two Sally Rooney books. One I hated, one I enjoyed. This we shall see. Um, so once again, you can use my code pumpkin to get your first book of the month book for $5. You can cancel any month. You just aren't feeling it. Um, really easy, just a wonderful service. Thank you, book of the month. Couldn't be happier, as usual. I'm gonna put you guys, cause they are my next big read. Okay, let's just, let's just dive in. I read a lot of sci-fi this month. I read some fantastic books. Um, I'm, yeah, let's just, let's just dive in. So starting off so, so strong contender for one of my favorite books of the year, A Memory Called Empire. This 
was so good. And I'm also gonna tag on, I did at the very end of this month, finally, because the library just did not want to let this book go, finally got the second book at the end of the month. So I'm gonna talk about them together, okay? A Memory Called Empire, and then the second book, A Desolation Called Peace. This is for the Gideon girlies, I feel like would really love this book. This was just a joy to read. Um, we are following a bunch of different characters, but mainly our main character lives on this tiny little station. We're in space, okay? Lives on this tiny little station at the edge of the empire. And the empire, I think, is technically pronounced like Texicatalan or something, but I just read it as Texicali, or like I kept thinking about like Tex Mex versus Cali Mex, and I don't, and no one in California calls it Cali Mex. This is such a tangent. But anyway, I just called it the Texicali Empire. It's not pronounced that way, but she lives at the edge of this empire in space. And she has just been awarded the position of being the ambassador for her station. And so she is sent to the center of the empire to be an ambassador. Sounds fun, right? However, the ambassador that she is replacing died mysteriously and immediately we know this was a murder. And so she's getting sent into this really dangerous situation where it's like, why did they kill the ambassador? Are they gonna kill her now? Like what is, she has no idea about what's going on politically in this city. And normally she would have more info to go on because the people in her station have found a way to upload and download memories. Um, so if you are like a pilot, for example, you would get the memories of the pilots that came before you. Like they have, they are deceased. You download all of their memories. And so you, even if you're a rookie pilot, you have this like vast store of memories in terms of like flight paths and oh I avoid this area because there's asteroids or something like that like you literally are given this wealth of knowledge which is so cool and so she is given her ambassador's old data but he hasn't been home he's been working right and he missed a couple uploads so she doesn't know anything for like i think a decade like she's missing a lot okay she has a rookie ambassador in her brain and it's faulty so usually the memories are just supposed to like sink and you just have them but for her the young ambassador guy is like still in her head like having a conversation okay it's so good. So like just that alone is really interesting. Throwing this girl into a very dangerous political situation with like faulty info. It was just so good. But then on top of that, we have the actual like world that she gets sent into. She has a liaison named Three Seagrass, who is such a wonderful character. Like I just really love books that take something that you are used to and they use it in a completely different way. I think that fantasy does this sometimes, but specifically sci-fi does this really well, um, where it will take something as simple as like a greeting, for example, or, okay, here's an example from this book. Um, a smile, right? Pretty much across all cultures, we understand what a smile means. But in all of these different cultures, because the empire is vast, they mean different things. So when our main girl smiles, like, oh, I'm, I agree, I'm happy with this kind of smile. The other people from the empire are like, <laughs> like they're freaked out. And so there's just all of these tiny little things, like even how you use certain words or how you name things, it just, it felt so new and it felt like my brain and my kind of, my imagination was expanding. The kind of endless possibilities, the things you can play with. Um, it was just so funny, really funny um, and just a really, excellent world. I think the second one wasn't as strong. It was sort of just like everything I loved about the first one in a slightly different font, I would say. Um, so it didn't like knock me off of my feet the way that A Memory Called Empire did, but I think together they were still so solid. I loved being in that world. The ending had me just like, ugh. An issue I had with the second one is that they introduced new characters and I so desperately wanted to know more. The backstory of like two characters in particular and we just didn't get that. So if she writes like a spinoff about those two characters, I would, oh, 
I'd be all over that. I felt so absorbed and I loved it so much, so much. Um, even just like the names of the, oh, A Memory Called Empire, Chef's Kiss, so, so happy I read this. <laughs> After that, I read a shorter book called Orbital. This follows a group of astronauts who are orbiting the world. In our 24 hours, our one day, they actually see 16 different sunrises and sunsets. So it kind of just follows them on one orbit. I thought it was really beautiful for the first like 60% and then I kind of like, I felt like I got what I needed to out of it. It was really beautifully written, just kind of reflecting on how small we are, but also how huge we are. Like we are so tiny if you look at space, right? But also we are so, we contain a universe within ourselves and I think that that all of the astronauts kind of ended up getting to that conclusion of like nothing matters but everything matters and I thought that was just expressed in a really beautiful way in this book but yeah I will say it got like a little repetitive at about 60% I was sort of done with it it also just felt like I I ended up reading a couple reviews to just be like what are other people thinking and I read one review that I Kind of agree with and it was like if this had been written by an astronaut it would have packed a little bit more of a punch but because these were like the imagined musings of someone who hasn't been to space it didn't feel kind of as true i guess i don't know how to explain it but it was it was very beautiful but just like a little too long i think it it said what it needed to say in the first 60 percent kind of like this review that was orbital. I'm moving you a little bit because I want to lean. <laughs> I'm tired. After that, I read a very highly anticipated read that is Immortal Dark. I'm so glad that I filmed my entire experience reading this book. So um, for three of these, I actually made a video where I live reacted to my top three most highly anticipated reads for September that were all kind of dark academia coded. So if you actually want to see me go on a journey, <laughs> with all three of these books, um, I will link that down below. But the reason I'm glad that I filmed my entire experience with Immortal Dark is because how I felt in the beginning is not how I felt in the end, but I think that the whole picture is valuable. Let me tell you what it's about first. We are following a girl who finds out that she is actually the heir to one of the kind of noble houses within a world where there are vampires. So basically vampires used to run rabid everywhere until we signed a treaty where they are only able to feed from people who are within these like 80 noble families and surprise, she's in one of them. Um, and she's the last one because her parents were killed, her aunt just passed away and her sister just got kidnapped. So she's the only one left in her family, and she's pretty sure that who kidnapped her sister? Her family's loyal vampire, okay? Because like every family has like companions or, or vampires that are within their house. She's pretty sure that that one took her sister. So she agrees to enter into this university, live in her house, in order to further investigate this world and this vampire to find her sister. I loved the beginning of this book. I think I loved it until maybe like 75%. The setting, the lore, just like the world that she created, and this is a debut, okay? The world that she created was just so good. Like I, I was so interested in it. I mentioned also that one thing I love about dark academia books that I feel like certain books claim that they're dark academia and they don't do this is I like to see what they're actually studying. Take us to class. Like they had philosophy classes and we actually sat down with the study group and they like debated about this per this philosophy that they were studying. Like I love that. Okay, so I just really appreciate the amount of detail that went into this book. However, double-edged sword, it got a little messy at the end. I started to realize that all of a sudden I, she introduced all of these really cool things and then they just all kind of went insane. Okay, we've got multiple murders. We've got a secret about the house itself. There's like secret societies. There's political intrigue. There's, um, she also has to freaking pass her classes because it's pass or fail. And if you fail, she's done, she's out. There's also where the hell is her sister? right? Who took her sister? All of these different things. There's so much 
that it got very confusing and I started to lose all sense of like space and time. But that being said, I feel like I know people would eat this book up. Specifically, I mentioned the Atlas Six. People who really loved the Atlas Six, I feel like you would get it because I also read some reviews afterwards and there basically seemed to be two camps. There is the people who did not like the first hundred or so pages loved the messy ending. And there are people like me who loved the first 75% and were kind of like, mm, about the ending. I think it did set up for an interesting second book. So I'm excited to see where it goes, but just it wasn't enjoyable for me. I'm of that camp, but I think that there are many people, I know that there are many people who would love this book. So let me know your thoughts. What team are you on? Did you like the ending? Did you like the beginning? Did you like both? That was Immortal Dark. Okay, <laughs> reading my notes. <laughs> um, For the next book, I read The Woods All Black. This is by the same author as Summer Suns, which I enjoyed but didn't love. Um, this one, I feel like right after I finished it, I loved it and now that I'm sitting on it, I'm just like, it was okay, okay? How do I start? This takes place in Appalachia in the 1920s. This is right after World War I. We have our main character who was a nurse in World War I on the front lines, okay? They've seen stuff. Um, coming back to the US, a lot of those nurses then became traveling nurses. Our main character gets sent to this tiny, tiny town in Appalachia um, to, you know, distribute vaccines, help with births, whatever. Like, if you need me, I'm here kind of position. When they arrive, though, they are not welcome. First of all, just simply because it's like a very, very small town and they don't warm to outsiders very well. Um, but also our main character doesn't use the word trans. He uses a word that was more popular in the 1920s. I don't want to guess, um, but basically he presents as male, but everyone in the town is like looking at his like paperwork and being like, we would like you to wear a dress. <laughs> like, um, so, and it's a very religious small town, right? So in order to like kind of appease the locals and everything, he tries to toe that line um, of what's acceptable, right, in this town. Um, until he finds another member of the community who is also trans. And it's a very short book. It's only 130 pages. So we're basically trying to make peace and be accepted by this teeny tiny town until it starts to look way too dangerous to even try that. And we got to get the hell out of here. I liked that it was as short as it was actually. Um, I thought it was the perfect length. I thought it was eerie and just the setting was really Oh, they just got it. I still, even now thinking about it, have a perfect picture of this town. It was great. There is a sex scene <laughs> that reading it, I was like, wait a damn minute. Like what is going on? So I will say that that scene threw me for a loop. Um, but yeah, this is just like horror. There is quite a bit of gore if I remember correctly but yeah it is it was just interesting like the little bits of history thrown in there as well about like the trans experience or just the queer experience in general in the 1920s ish yeah I love that we're getting kind of more historically accurate queer stories um just because the community was there but we just kind of don't hear about it that much and so so overall a great read but there were bits of it that I was just like, huh? <laughs> huh? So let me know your thoughts if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, the woods all black. <laughs> Hold on, let me go get my coffee. I'm losing my voice already. I'm out of practice. I haven't been talking that much. <sighs> okay, after that, I feel like I read huge books. <laughs> this was a month of really long books. Um, I read Elantris. Elantris? Elantris? This is Brandon Sanderson's first book. Um, I will say it is obviously his first book. I also was told by sources I trust that this was a standalone and I do think you can read it as a standalone but this actually does continue. Um, I'm going to read it as a standalone. Kind of done with these characters but it wasn't a bad book in any way. This just wasn't, it wasn't Mistborn. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, 
Elantris is, Elantris just felt like a classic. There was a nostalgia to it. Let me tell you what it's about. Let me look at my notes. So the story has multiple points of view. On one hand, we're following a princess who was just engaged to a prince of another country. She decides to go a little bit early to surprise him before the marriage. Chat. They've had a great connection. They've been exchanging letters. Seems like there's a real chance of like this actually being a love match. They really respect each other. So she wants to like hang out before the wedding, you know, and, and just be like, hey, I actually like you. Like, let's make this work, you know? Um, so she's on her way there, okay? We also have the POV of the prince who is living in the kind of capital of his kingdom that is overshadowed by this former city called Elantris. This was like a utopia, basically. There were normal people and then they would just sometimes get taken over by this sickness that isn't a sickness and they would kind of become gods. They would become immortal, their skin would turn silver and shining, they would have magic, and they would go live in this city of Elantris where everything was good. And you know, they'd kind of pay it back sometimes, like you could normal people could go to the healers and like they'd heal whatever you know until one day these gods just fell they were overcome by this plague and they just died these horrible deaths like they just decayed before your eyes okay and so now instead of normal people hoping that one day they would get the god disease there are people still falling ill to this plague and so they just like throw them in the old city to die okay um, our story starts off strong with the prince who we immediately like. A good king if there ever is one. All right, a great leader gets sick and they throw him into Elantris. We also have the POV of a religious leader who is trying to expand his kingdom through kind of religious revolution. Um, so he comes into the kingdom to try and create a, a kind of holy war um, in order to have this kingdom fall. So all of these things are converging in our prince's kingdom and he's not there. And he's just trying to survive the day, okay? With his little, with the plague, all right? So I could just feel, you know how Sanderson has a lot of like world building classes, like writing classes that he offers for free, like wonderful resources. I feel like I could see that blueprint here really easily. Like it was a good book, but it was good because the story building skills, the world building skills were just really, it wasn't formulaic, but it was just like, I can see how someone could use this as really good teaching material for this is how you build a basic, fantasy world. So I don't know, I was just very kind of aware of that as I was reading it, if that makes any sense. Again, wasn't a bad book, like technically a very good book, I would say. There also was in specifically the prince's storyline, this kind of idea of if you give people a reason to live, they will live better. So the people who are living in this kind of quarantined city, right, they are just lounging about waiting to die when the prince comes in and he's like, we're gonna give everybody a job. We're gonna get to work. And all of a sudden people start to feel better. Like I get what he was trying to say. Like I do think that having reasons to live and having kind of pride, the whole idea of like, if you live in trash, you feel like trash and you become trash, right? Um, I get, I get that, I think, but he, this was a little too black and white in terms of like, if we just make the former soldiers into bodyguards, suddenly they'll have a reason to live and everyone will be happy. And it's kind of like, I don't think it's that easy, you know? But, mm. so once again, it wasn't Mistborn, but it did the job. Ooh, after that, ooh, I have it. After that, speaking of book of the month, I think I got this last month. This is The Seventh Veil of Salome. This is by Silvia Moreno-Garcia who wrote Mexican Gothic, which I loved. The beautiful ones, which I didn't love. So I was very interested in this one. This could and should be made into a mini series, please. I would love to see this on film. This book was a little confusing and this is why I think it honestly would work a little bit better in a more visual format, like a mini series. Um, this takes place in the 1950s in Hollywood, okay? 
We're following three women. One is Vera. Vera has been plucked from obscurity. She was just like living her life in Mexico and somebody saw her and was like, oh my God, this is our new it girl for The Seventh Veil vale of Salome, a movie that they were really struggling to cast the main character of Salome. And it was one of those things of like, do we pick an established starlet or do we pick a brand new face? And they wanted a brand new face. So we find Vera, grab her, bring her to Hollywood, make her into a star. Next we have Nancy. Nancy is someone who has been in Hollywood for a very long time, trying to get her big break. She auditioned for Salome, obviously lost out to it, to Vera, okay? Um, and then we are following Salome herself. We are actually getting bits of the film um, or the story in general. And then also kind of sprinkled throughout the story, we have interviews with people around the film. So we have like the script writer, we have the casting director, we have blah, 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 blah. All of this made for a little bit of a confusing reading experience because we had the very first chapter is like a documentary. Like I thought this was gonna be kind of like a Daisy sick, Daisy and the, Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. I thought it was going to be like that where it was kind of all interviews, but then we jump into third person when we see the story of Vera and then of Nancy. And then we also, like I said, then we jump into still third person, but like a completely removed like screenplay of Salome, which I get that it does kind of mirror like a lot of the things that Salome goes through we see in Vera or Nancy's storyline like I get why it's there but it was just kind of a lot going on in this book. I will say I think I read this in one sitting if not definitely one day. I very much wanted to know what happened. I thought it was interesting the entire way through. I wish it was kind of told in a slightly different format. But yeah, when it comes to just like old Hollywood stories, I eat them up. Um, so I'm very happy with this one. Very different from um, her other work, I would say, which is cool to see an author have like such a different style in pretty much everything they've released. So this is The Seventh Veil vale of Salome. Thank you very much. Next up, I was continuing with my Dark Academia read, so once again, you can go look at my full reaction to it in my other video, but next up is An Academy for Liars. This one was a really interesting read. Again, I'm glad that I kind of documented the entire process because I was very just kind of underwhelmed by literally 90% of this book, and then the last 30 pages I was like, my pulse was racing, I was crying, like the ending was impeccable. But to get there just like wasn't my favorite journey to go on, let's just say. An Academy for Liars. We are dealing with our main girl who is just not having a great time. She's engaged to this shitty guy that cheats on her. She catches him at their engagement party, like just bad vibes, okay? She's not, not loving where she is. So she runs off after seeing her fiance and best friend together, okay? Runs off, gets a mysterious phone call from a phone booth okay, as one does. She like passed some test that she doesn't know that she took and she has been invited to this kind of magical academy. She goes, we learn about the magic. It's all about persuasion. I think my frustration with this book was just that the concept was really great but we didn't go into detail about these really cool concepts. So the magic is basically you can use these powers of persuasion to either persuade other people to do things like pick up this coffee cup or you can, if you get powerful enough, persuade matter and persuade time. Um, you can kind of open new worlds even. So really cool, but just never kind of explained things enough for me to be interested. I didn't feel like there were really any stakes. Like the only thing bad that was going to happen to her is that if she messes up in any way and she gets expelled, they will just erase her memories of this academy and send her back home. And it was like, she's only been at the school for a couple months, hasn't really made any friends. Like, what she just goes back to like a kind of shitty life like it didn't feel very life or death right but when it seems like her powers are maybe too strong the higher ups in the academy kind of take notice and it maybe isn't a good thing again concept great it was just sort of a letdown where these things were introduced and i thought like this is really cool 
and then it just never was cool. I don't know how to explain it. Didn't love the romance. There's also like something occurs with the kind of romantic lead. Like we learn about something that happened in his life that I feel like is pretty damn monumental and we just kind of brush over it and I can't believe it was brushed over. But I did think that the ending was just great. So I wish the power of that ending was throughout the entire book, unfortunately. But give it a try. Um, there was never a part that was like really bad. I think that the writing style in the beginning wasn't great, but if you get through the first like 100 pages, the writing kind of fixes itself. Um, but in terms of just like the content, it was never bad. It just was not good until the end. Does that make any sense? An Academy for Liars. After that, I read my last Dark Academia book, again, in the video, um, A Dark and Drowning Tide. This was frustrating <laughs> because <sighs> Alison Saft, I really loved A Far Wilder Magic. I was okay with A Darkness Comes to Call, what was that, A Darkness? Anyway, her first book. I was fine with it. She wrote another book. It was published under St. Martin's Press slash Wednesday Books, so I never actually formally talked about it because of the boycott, um, but A Fragile Enchantment was not good. Was bad. Like, a bad book. <laughs> it was really not a good book. So for A Dark and Drowning Tide, I had low expectations for this book. And I think that those low expectations made the beginning of this book even better because I, I wasn't expecting it to be so good. A Dark and Drowning Tide follows a group of people who are going off, their king is sending them on a mission to find this spring or this well where the magic of this world allegedly comes from because the magic of the world is kind of tied to water which i thought was really cool and the king wants to find the source and so he sets all of these people off on this ship to go find this thing our main character is a folklorist so her job which i thought was really cool her job is to look at folk tales and try to find the truth within them. All cultures have stories and fairy tales and things like that, but they all kind of come from a nugget of truth. And so she, that's her, her job and like her entire academic career was going through folk tales, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, and then her academic rival, Nemesis, she's also something similar, but she's more like doing on the ground research and they are both like there they share an academic advisor and they're kind of like the darlings, like these two of this academic advisor, right? They get sent off with a couple other people, like I said, to go on this mission. Night number one or night number two of their mission, their academic advisor who is in charge of this mission gets murdered. And so we not only have to go on this magical adventure to find this well, but we also have to figure out who murdered the advisor. It can only be someone who was on this boat, right? So it's kind of like a locked room murder mystery, which I loved. It had so many ingredients of a book that I would love. And I thought that the beginning of this book was so good, so excellent, but pretty much the second that the murder occurs and now we have to like, do the plot. Like the plot has to do its thing. It didn't. It never did. It was just really boring. I also didn't like the ending. I also mentioned it in the other video, but I could not understand why it was categorized as adult instead of YA. This read absolutely as a YA, but then there was one steamy scene and it felt so out of place. And I think it was just to get that adult rating. It was so bizarre. Actually, all of the kind of steamier or like romantic scenes felt really out of place. I think that she kind of had an idea for a scene like, I want this to be the first kiss scene. And then she wrote around it and it just, it didn't get us there organically. And especially the steamier scene. I was like, what are you guys doing? Like, what, what are we doing right now? Right now? Um, wasn't the time or place, let's just say that. This was a letdown and it started off strong, which I feel like I had low expectations and then I was like, oh, this is really great. And then it just went back down. I don't know, I don't know, man. That was a dark and drowning tide. After that, I feel like this month was either sci-fi or like 
creepy religious stuff. I finally got my hands on Pew. This is by the same author as the biography of X, which I loved. I didn't finish. I loved the author's writing style, but I felt like the biography of X just was a little too long. Like they went a little too hard on the world building and like the background and the details. So um, I was excited for this one because Pew is actually quite short and it did the job. Uh, this is about a person who appears in town sleeping on a pew in a in the like this small town's little church doesn't know their name doesn't know where they came from doesn't know anything doesn't seem to have a gender doesn't seem to really have a race they aren't white but like nobody's like everyone's kind of like what what are you like where did you come from are you a boy or a girl we really need to know are you a boy or a girl? It's a very religious community, very small town. And this one family, being the good Christians that they are, kind of adopt this person and bring them into the home. And we just kind of, I think it's actually only over the course of a week that they are living in this town. We just kind of follow their experience. They don't seem to be super bothered about like not knowing anything about themselves, but the townspeople really are. And then it kind of leads up to this very creepy festival that the town has and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I just thought it was eerie and well done and I really enjoyed it. So that was Pew, a very quick read. After that, I read Soulless. This was actually recommended uh, by one of you when I was asking for like funny rom-coms that I could read on the airplane. I ended up reading it before the airplane. This is called like a steampunk alternative London. It takes place in kind of the Victorian, definitely in the Victorian era. Queen Victoria makes an appearance. Um, Victorian era London, if there were werewolves and vampires and all the other mythical creatures. And again, it's kind of steampunk. So like the carriages are like, there's like weird little flying machines. It's it's cool. Okay, I, I appreciated the world. We have supernatural beings such as vampires, for example, but we also have preternatural beings which have less of a soul. So like a vampire, the reason that they are supernatural is because they have like too much soul right? They have too much essence. Um, and our main character doesn't have a soul. <laughs> so cons being she doesn't like feel things very strongly, right? She kind of just goes through life as like, meh, meh, you know? Um, but pros is she cannot be affected by supernatural things. So like a vampire, if they feed off of her, will die. She has like poison blood. Okay, she gets wrapped up in this kind of murder mystery where all of these vampires or like supernatural beings in general are being killed, but then they're maybe being like reborn and turned into monster thing. I don't know. Anyway, she gets wrapped up in this investigation and the head of the investigation is a werewolf from Scotland. <laughs> they, of course, fall in love and we just go on this journey with them. Here's the thing, it was so frustrating because I got that this book was funny like i understood i know there are people out there who like this is their exact kind of humor i get it it just wasn't my sense of humor you know so i could i get it like if people love it i 100 percent understand but for me it was just like not there i thought the beginning was really funny until i realized that that sense of humor was going to be there the whole time it was sort of like every single sentence was written to be funny or witty or sarcastic. So it just kind of got old. For example, like one of the recurring jokes is the fact that she is half Italian. My battery's dying. So they'd make all these weird like Italian jokes or like anything that happened to her would be like, oh, because horror of horrors, she's Italian or like the werewolf guy is Scottish and so he's like super barbaric and whatever. Um, I was just kind of like, I got it. I know people who would think that's funny, but it just kind of like the jokes got old for me. This was also a little insta lovey. I did appreciate the setup of it. Like she, she's just like so annoying and brilliant and the like chief of police or like whatever he is, is just so exhausted by her, but also like amazed that she's this amazing woman. So I know that this would hit for some people. Unfortunately, it just got kind of boring for me, but I'm glad that I 
gave it a try. I would still pick it up if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, but it just like wasn't all there for me. But it's a series as well if you're looking for a series to dive into. After that, very quickly, as I was getting ready for my flight and I was just like trying to distract myself, nighttime flights, guys, are the worst because like I hate morning flights because I sleep really poorly the night before, but night flights, I'm just like pacing around my house trying to do, like trying to not go to the airport a million hours early, okay? Um, so I was distracting myself and I read Mickey Seven. My husband had already read it and enjoyed it. He's a sci-fi guy. If he's gonna read anything fiction, it's gonna be sci-fi or like, is this a red flag? He loves, this is one of his favorites, perfume, where the guy kills a lot of women, specifically redheads, to make perfume of their bodies. Let me know what you think about that. So he had already read Mickey Seven and the trailer for the film just came out. We are collectively, as a household, worried about this because we love Bong Juno, um, the director of Parasite, for example. Um, he's directing it and Robert Pattinson is starring in it, which I'm very excited about. And Kurt loves Batman, Rob Pat as Batman. We are excited about the ingredients going into this film, but we're very worried about the result because it's kind of a comedy and I don't know about Bong Juno doing comedy. Anyway. Working out and I wanted to get off of Earth. You're applying to be an expendable? Yeah. You read through the whole application. Anyway, I read Mickey Seven to prepare for the film and this is a very short sci-fi felt very akin to like something Andy Weir would write if he was a little bit darker. I feel like Andy Weir is a little too hopeful and always has like a general positive outlook on humanity and this is not. <laughs> so Mickey Seven very quickly is about uh, a future where we are starting communities on different planets and this guy Mickey wants to get off of his home planet because he has dredged up a bunch of like gambling debts and the only way he can escape the gangs is to literally leave the planet. So he wants to get on this mission to go colonize a new place, right? And the only job he can get is to be an expendable. So basically they need a human that they can run tests on. Like when they land on the planet, how do they know that the air is not toxic? So they like send Mickey out there and they're like, take off your helmet and if he lives he lives yay and if he doesn't they can just like revamp him so we're following him on his seventh time being revamped and what happens when they thought he died but maybe he didn't and maybe they made an extra mickey and now there's two mickeys and that's not allowed and neither one of them wants to be dead so Either they have to kill each other or like hide each. It was just like kind of comedic, silly. Um, I had a good time with it. I thought it was a good length for what it was. And yeah, I just overall had a great time. So Mickey Seven, if you're looking for just like a quick sci-fi, no notes, I had fun. <laughs> We're almost done, I promise. I ended up getting the Wren in the Holly Library from the library and I'd been waiting for it for a really long time on hold and to the point where I didn't remember why I put it on hold. I'm pretty sure somebody from this channel recommended it. So as usual, I went into it knowing nothing. So I was reading this on vacation. I was jet lagged, so I was waking up really early in the morning and I would just read for hours before the sun came up. Um, so I was in like a weird headspace, but I will say this was a book I know would hit for people. It just felt like a book I've read maybe a million times before. This takes place in New York City after something happens where like all of a sudden monsters are real. Ooh, the sun is coming out, sorry. Um, monsters are real. There's all different kinds. Like again, we have vampires, we have werewolves, X, Y, Z. And because of that, society has kind of collapsed. So our main girl just has such a tragic backstory. And I think that that was what kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It was just like a little too much. Like she was orphaned and then was picked up by a gang because she has this like really incredible talent for picking locks. So she becomes this incredible burglar for this gang and then after that gang like physically and mentally abuses her she escapes only to get saved by the owner of a brothel and then she has to work like it was uh, it felt just like a little cheap 
you know like it was talking about a struggle and like this character has a tragic backstory but it just kind of felt gimmicky I don't know how to how to describe it it, it felt like oh we need to give her a tragic backstory so this is let's just throw all of these things at the wall and hope that they stick it just it didn't feel too thought out it was kind of like tragic backstory 101 I don't know um but anyway she's this really great thief and she is tasked with stealing something from this library in this very rich person's home so she breaks in and lo and behold the person she's stealing from catches her which never happens and she ends up having to enter a deal with this person who is an unknown monster like we don't know is he a vampire is he a wraith is he mm, we don't know um so she ends up getting caught up with him and having to then steal a few things for him blah 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 blah. i was unaware that this was like a hardcore romanticy like focus on the romance so there was a lot of like smut that i was not interested in it just kind of wasn't what i thought it was gonna be and that's my fault i did think it was just a little cookie cutter like ooh, our main girl is a badass with this weird skill and she's got this tragic backstory and then we have like our main lead who is like cheekbones that could cut you and dark hair and he has a tragic backstory it was yeah having the word library in it gave me an image of the book that it was not library makes me think of i don't know not grungy gangs of New York. Also, why were all the monsters Irish? Like, all of the monsters, the vampires and the werewolves and everything were Irish and just like immigrated to the US, but they all had like thick accents. But for what? This is like 2020 something. It was present day. I was just like, where did all these heavily accented Irish people come from? Running New York City. Like what? <laughs> anyway, anyway, that was the red in the Holly Library, allegedly a series. Uh, definitely a series, the way they ended, yeah. Okay, last two. I've had this book available to me for a very long time. I have the arc of it. The book is already out, okay? This is The Mistress of Lies. So again, I have the arc version, which means it likely went through another round of edits before it was published. So I will say this book needed another round of editing. There were typos, there were sentences, like entire paragraphs that were then repeated word for word, like later in the book. Like I don't think they knew where to put this one paragraph that they wanted. Yeah, there were just like little things that on it, like a sentence level were kind of messy. So I'm not gonna judge it too hard in that respect because I do know that it was, that was, fixed hopefully before it was published this was another book that had a great concept and i think kind of fumbled it unfortunately we are following i think it's only two yeah it's two pov which i think hurt the book i'll get into that in a second but we have two povs we have shan who is part of the nobility in this society we meet her when she kills her father <laughs> she assassinates her father um in order to become head of her household to get in the political game and make changes and do all these things right she's a very ambitious person so she is the head of her house in this world that has blood magic so kind of half of the population has blood magic where they can just like control things and do different things using their own blood or in a lot of other times using other people's blood, right? It seemed really cool, okay? Um, however, the other half of the population, the unblooded, are just heavily discriminated against. They don't have any of the same opportunities as blooded people. And her twin brother, even though he is nobility, he is unblooded. So everything she does is sort of like to help her brother. Like she's trying to gain political power so that she can get better rights for the unblooded and like make what she believes is mostly positive changes okay so shan ambitious very smart a little bloodthirsty willing literally willing to kill for what she wants okay then we have samuel Samuel is unblooded, barely scraping by, and harboring some kind of secret. And when he accidentally becomes witness to one of a string of murders, he kind of catches the eye of Shan, and they embark on this journey together to overthrow the Eternal King, okay? Could've, should've, would've been great. Uh, it was really good, I think, 
for, I got to about 60% and I was still fully enjoying the book and then it just quickly dropped off. I think that it didn't deliver on any of the things it had laid out for us. I think that Shan started as such a cool, strong character and then she just kind of, where did that go, you know? Um, it also kind of veered off course to really focus on romance. There's a kind of polyamorous turn that the story takes and it really kind of delved into that for like a good 20% of the book and I was sort of like, plot though? And then I think, like I mentioned, it's dual POV and it felt very, like I felt like we were reading the story with blinders on because we only really saw from their eyes, right? We only saw from Shan's POV, we only saw the stuff that Shan saw, and then we only saw the stuff that Samuel saw, and it just, there would be kind of time jumps, and like the world, we just kind of never, I felt like the world was very small. I don't really know how to explain it, but I think that it could have been great. The ending, things happened so fast near the end. It's going to be a series, so I feel like the second book has potential, but I was just kind of let down. I, I really liked the setup, and then we just were kind of, again, like once the plot actually needs to start plotting, it just, we lost it. So that was unfortunate, but let me know your thoughts. Like how much did another round of editing do to Mistress of Lies? If you've read it, please let me know because I'm, I'm not invested enough to actually go and read the fully published version again, um, but I would love to know. So Mistress of Lies. Okay, and last but not least, I technically read this in October, okay? But I wanna talk about it while it is fresh because I'm confused. I'm very confused by this book. So we started on like the highest of high notes, okay? A memory of empire. Impeccable. And we're ending with how to end a love story. This was recommended not only by a lot of you guys, but also by people I trust. I didn't like this book. And then I thought, oh my god, is this another seven year slip where like I'm the only person who didn't like this book? Turns out people also didn't like it. So <laughs> I just never, I never heard anything negative about it. I only heard positives. So I was reading it like very shocked by my reaction to it. Turns out I'm not the only one. We just aren't very vocal in our dislike of the book, okay? For a romance book, I feel like romance books tend to skew very positive on Goodreads. Um, this is sitting at like a 3.6 or something, which is usually kind of like a red flag for romance books. So I'm not alone. But so just so you know, I went into it with positive feelings. Okay, so many people recommended it. I was ready to love this book. So this is not a spoiler, but our story begins with our main character's sister committing suicide. And the way that she does this is she jumps in front of someone's car. The person who is driving that car is a classmate of our main character who like didn't know her sister, didn't really even know our main character, just like was the popular guy at school and was just in the very wrong place at the very wrong time, okay? So that's how it starts. That is the connection of our two main characters is that he was in the car that killed her sister. They've never spoken since. Um, since that time, fast forwarding, I think like 13 or 15 years later, our main character has written a very successful YA, kind of like a Pretty Little Liars-esque series, book series, that is being turned into a TV series. So she is shipped off to LA to work with the writers of this TV series, um, and she is also going to be involved in the script, all of this stuff, right? Our other main character, Grant, is a successful TV screenwriter. And what do you think he's going to be head screenwriter for? Who do you think he has to work with for the next 20 weeks? So we embark on this journey of them working together and it just wasn't ever good. What was frustrating about this book is that there were parts of it that I thought were really great. Like I think near the end, um, she kind of reflects more about all of the feelings she feels towards her sister. Um, and I thought that was beautiful. Like the grief and the anger and the shame and all of this stuff. I thought that that was written beautifully. And I thought that the relationship with her parents 
especially after the death of her sister, was so interesting. And I thought that the parts that we saw were written, maybe not my favorite, but I thought they had just like a lot of power behind them. I liked reading those scenes. But in terms of the actual romance, and this is a romance book, there was nothing there. <laughs> there was like, I, it was so frustrating. I thought that the side characters, <clears throat> the other writers in the room were all great, but Grant was just like a nothing, he was just like a charming guy. Like he was just a guy who was a good team leader and was just generally nice, even though he was not nice to Helen. Like when you first meet, granted this is 15 years later, but honestly, I don't care. When you are meeting the sister of the girl that you accidentally killed and you know it's gonna be a rough meeting, I would go in there with my tail between my legs, okay? Like I would, you know, how are we, like, are you comfortable with this? I'm so sorry, by the way, how have you been doing? And he kind of walks in there, like we get his internal monologue of like, oh my God, I'm so nervous, I'm so apologetic, this is so hard for me. But his front facing is like, oh, do you have a problem with us working together? Because I really don't care. Like, and then during the second meeting, he's like, okay, no, we got off on the wrong foot, I'm gonna apologize. And then he walks into the room and he's like, so you need to fix your attitude. Like, oh! It was, I was just like, I understood why Helen was acting, even though I felt like she was acting a bit too immature. I could get why, like what got her there. Like she lost her sister, I get that. But Grant was just kind of like, she's got a problem with me. And like, this is my job. I'm gonna write this TV show. Like it was so bizarre. And then once they finally like got together, it was one of those things of like, we're, just getting this out of our system. Helen is very like, you know, you're not gonna fall in love with me. I'm gonna move back to the East Coast after I'm done with this. So like, <clears throat> this is just a fling for the summer. It was such a frustrating read and I cried at the end, but I wasn't crying because of the romance. I was crying because of the grief and the relationship with her sister. Like there was never anything about the romance that had me feeling feels. <laughs> Sorry, emergency, my foot fell asleep. Um, if you've read the book, please let me know your thoughts as well. I just was very let down. I would have loved more of all of the other stuff and so much less of the romance. I don't think that that needed to be like the starting point of a romance, you know? Like I would have loved to just go on a journey with Helen. She could have fallen in love with like anyone else and I think that the journey would have still been really great. I don't think that her falling in love with the person who was in the car that killed her sister honestly added anything to the story. And like all of her friends around her are like, I think you're trauma bonding. I think you're trauma bonding. <laughs> and she's just kind of like, no, no. I, I don't know. So if you've read the book, let me know, please. That was just a really weird way to end this month of reading, especially because I went into it, first of all, knowing about the background, like I already knew going in what it was gonna be about. Um, I just didn't expect it to be like not good, if that makes sense. So, however, on the plane home, I did read two good books that I'm excited to talk about in our next reading wrap up. Uh, I will not do it today because this is already too long, but that is what I read. Um, A Memory Called Empire. If you liked Gideon the Ninth, it's not as like laugh out loud funny. Like Gideon the Ninth had me having to read in private because I was laughing so loud and it was embarrassing to be sitting in a cafe, literally just being like, ha! <laughs> a Memory Called Empire isn't that funny, but it still is just so witty funny, okay? Really good. That is my like main takeaway. If you're a Gideon fan and you're looking for something to fill the gap that Electo has left all of us with in our hearts. Um, a Memory Called Empire. So good. So once again, uh -huh, uh, thank you to Book of the Month. So excited for both of these. Mm, you have no idea. So once again, you can use my code PUMPKIN to get your first book for $5 absolutely love and I will catch you guys next time I'm actually okay it's not my next one but later in this month I will be partaking in a revamp you know how I did my 
week of reading Christmas rom-coms and I slowly lost my mind. Um, I for some reason have decided to do that with Halloween rom-coms. <laughs> so um, pretty much starting now I'm going to edit this video and then I'm going to dive into my first rom-com. I found so many. I don't know how I'm gonna read them all, but yeah, we're gonna read some Halloween rom-coms and hope I survive. So um, thank you so much to Book of the Month. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. And um, yeah, let me know all your thoughts as usual, please. I will catch you guys next time, okay? Sorry for the lighting. It is such a weird day outside. It feels like autumn though. I'm, air conditioner isn't on. I'm wearing this sweater and I'm not sweating. So you win some, you win some. So I will catch you later, okay? Thank you so much as always.